Hey, Kevin here, host and producer of Philly Who, with a quick reminder that there are fewer than two weeks left until the live show on the main stage of World Cafe Live with Mike Solomonov and Steve Cook. That night, we will discuss the stories and inspirations that led Mike and Steve to become two of Philadelphia's most popular restaurateurs and led them to create Federal Donuts, Zahav, The Rooster, Dizengoff, Goldie, and Abe Fisher. Everyone in attendance will get an exclusive first taste of Kafar, their new restaurant opening this summer, and we'll also hear from Jesse Ito and Becca Craig, two previous guests of Philly Who, who will update us on their story and then join me, Mike, and Steve for a discussion about the Philly food scene. Tickets are on sale now at podphillywho.com forward slash live. Grab them now while they're hot, and I hope to see you there on May 1st. Our head is spinning. We don't know what's right and wrong. And it was just made so simple for me. You know, plants have the power to cure. You're listening to Philly Who, the podcast that tells the stories of the doers, thinkers, and performers of Philadelphia. My name is Kevin Schmidlin, and today I'm chatting with Nicole Marquis. Nicole is the creator of Hip City Veg, a fast casual restaurant chain with multiple locations in Philly and in DC. Hip City Veg has a lot of what you'd expect from a cafe in Philly, burgers, cheesesteaks, crispy chicken sandwiches, but what you may not realize is that all of the food is plant-based. What I love doing is creating an environment that just feels really good and people not even know that it's a plant-based menu. Nicole's vision for Hip City Veg practically appeared out of the blue. While in her early 20s, she was still figuring out her career. So she cracked open a book about nutrition. What she learned inspired her so much that she immediately knew what she wanted to pursue. And this is me like at home in my slippers, not a penny to my name. My parents just getting home from work and I'm like, Guys, I would open a vegan restaurant chain. At first, Nicole's parents didn't buy into the idea. Then her father was diagnosed with diabetes. Nicole guided him in adopting a plant-based diet, and pretty soon, the benefits were clear. He lost 25 pounds and put his type 2 diabetes into remission. Four years later, she opened the first Hip City Veg, and this time, she had buy-in immediately. Day one, we had a line that wrapped around the block down San Her story and the story of Hip City Veg, now on Philly Who. Nicole Marquis' official title is the CEO of Marquis & Co., which is the company that manages her three restaurant brands. One of them, the fast casual chain Hip City Veg, has several current and forthcoming locations in the Philly area and one in D.C. The two other restaurants she created, which are Charlie Was a Sinner and Bar Bomb Bomb, are full-service restaurants and also exclusively feature plant-based food and drink. And while Nicole and later her family paved the way to plant-based eating for Philly consumers, she didn't really discover her passion for veganism, a word she sometimes avoids because of the heavy stigma, until she was 26 years old. Before that, she had been a vegetarian for a few years, and before that, as a child, she ate meat just like the average American. American, or maybe more than the average American. My mother is Puerto Rican and my father is half Italian, half French. So meat was a part of every single meal. Even now going to Puerto Rico to visit my family, when I tell them I don't eat any meat, they go, okay, no problem. They give me beans with like pork in it. And I'm like, no, no, I don't eat meat. No, actually no Actually meat. don't eat. And, you know, my grandmother would say, well, are you sick or is everything okay? You know, so it was really foreign. So when you were a child, if someone asked you what you wanted to be when you grew up, what did you say? I said for a long time, it was my friend Amira Bass and I uh, growing up in Elkins Park, we would both say that we wanted to be neurosurgeons. I actually said that I think she said it first, and I was like, yeah, <laughs> that that's good. what I want to do. I want to be a neurosurgeon. <laughs> Having, you know, I didn't really know much about it, obviously. And she actually went on to become a physician at Penn. And I definitely took a more windy road. Right. And, and so you, you would go on to study undergrad at Temple University 
and study communications with a minor in theater. That's right. Correct? Yeah. Now, I saw a quote in an article, correct me if I'm wrong, that you've said that your worst subject in high school was English. Yes. So then why did you study communications in theater? <laughs> I know. Probably a challenge. <laughs> right? yeah, truly. Like, you know, what, yeah. what was the thought process there? Well, I, I fell in love with Shakespeare and poetry and, you know, I had a background in ballet. So I wanted to do something in the performing arts. Right. You know, I wasn't planning to go to college. That was my parents who were like, wow. oh, really? You're not planning to go to college. Well, let's just, uh, let's tell you what's going to happen. <laughs> well, what was your plan? <laughs> my plan was to go to New York to see if I could get into a ballet theater, be an artist. You know, no plan, yeah. really. It's total opposite from what I'm like right. now, <laughs> you know, where everything's planned. And so when, you're, when your parents vetoed that, were you, were you upset? Yeah. Very upset, but they definitely persuaded me. And my father even took me to the orientation at Temple. And I got in and he took me to choose the classes that I was going to take. And I was kicking and screaming the whole way through until they were like, well, you can take a Shakespeare class and you can also, why don't we do a minor in theater? I'm like, okay, this is sounding not so bad, yeah. you know, and little by little, I was really able to take classes that um, were so enriching. Yeah. And so you kept reading, I would imagine, due to your love of literature. Yeah. I love the drama. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah studying theater, you got a lot of yeah. drama, right? So when you graduated, then what was your plan? I got into California Institute of the Arts for theater with emphasis on classical drama. So you were diving all in on all in. theater and school. Yeah, absolutely. And I was excited about getting an MFA and really pursuing that career at the time. Uh, went out to California and I don't, California Institute of the Arts, it's, it was, it's Walt Disney's school. So oh, it's wow. this sort of bubble of artistic exploration yeah, on yeah. this little campus on a hill in Santa Clarita, California, um, north of LA. And, you know, everyone's kind of experimenting, doing drugs, you know, you have the naked yeah. performance art show where right. they're like sliding on like butter or something. Yeah. I don't know. It's like really weird stuff. Real life there. hair. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just everyone's totally artsy. And yes. yeah. so, so did you enjoy that? Uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I, you know, was able to understand my limits as an artist and where, you know, and and really perform next to some great actors. But I did quickly realize that this is not for me long term. Oh, and how did you realize that? You know, I really wasn't that good. I was good enough, but I didn't feel like I could really excel in it. And I had such a love for the literature and watching, you know, being a spectator, watching the art and being moved by art and understanding it. Um, but as a performer, I wasn't, uh, you know, like every good actor, I spent a lot of time in restaurants. I was, you know, going from gig to gig and it just wasn't fulfilling for me. It was also really self-centered. I was constantly thinking and judging myself. What do I look like? What do I sound like? How am I perceived? Did I feel that right? Did I express that right? What do I look like in the mirror? What, you know, all the, you know, you spend in ballet, you spend eight hours a day in front of a mirror. So it was just so incredibly for me, it became very self-centered. And I don't find deep happiness in that. What I'm finding now is that my purpose has to be much greater than myself. Yeah. And I, I know that there are artists and actors who absolutely find that yeah. and know that their art is affecting others in a really positive way. I just didn't get there. Yeah. I mean, and with something like that, so much time is spent alone with art, right? Whether it's visual or performing because what 90% of the time you're rehearsing you're it's it's oh, it's yeah. self-centered kind of like like what you said so was that a hard realization to make that that wasn't for you especially after spending so much time studying it for sure how did you feel when you realized that that was like a, a rock bottom wow. in some ways you know so I came home having this like 
existential moment. Yeah. My mom, she has a really uh, a thick Puerto Rican accent, and we have like a book of like things that mommy said, you know. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I came down one day, and I was like, "What is the meaning of life?" And she's like, "You know, it's Jen and Jen." And I'm like, Jen and Jen? Who's Jen and Jen? I'm talking about my life here. I don't need Jen and Jen. And finally, she, I'm like, oh, you mean yin and yang? <laughs> <laughs> like a balance? <laughs> you know, we say that. Yeah. We, we talk about that all the time and make fun of her, That's which great. is really fun. She's but, the best. Yeah. But she helped me, you know, and my father helped me because I moved back home with them by just, you know, giving me a space to really think about what it is I wanted to do. But then I was hit with it quickly. Yeah, so how did you find it? You know, I do what I always do, and I start reading, and I just start researching, and you find answers. You really do. Um, how do you choose what book to read or, or what to research yeah. with something so existential? Great question. <laughs> yeah, and it wasn't sort of like, I'm going to read, you know, this specific book that's going to give me an answer. I just looked for something that was interesting. And when you're interested in things, and I tell people this that are asking me, I want to find what it is that I'm meant to do. It's just being interested in things. Yeah. Keep researching, keep reading different books, even if it's self-help to nutrition to, but, and that's what it was for me. And, you know, I was vegetarian for years and came home. My friend just recommended I read The China Study by Dr. T. Colin Campbell. And that blew my mind. I thought, there's real science out there. Yeah, so what did The China Study say? Right, so it's a comprehensive nutritional analysis that says not 50%, not 70%, but 100% of the time, animal protein can turn on and off, like a light switch, cancer growth. That's a tremendous fact right there. So I just kept researching more. It touts the health benefits of plant-based diet and how fiber can really help to reduce or eliminate diet-related diseases. Yeah. When I read that, I was so excited because I thought, I know something that no one around me knows this. I've got to share this. I have to tell everyone. And so... But I also, I think my enthusiasm was I found something worth fighting for. You know, I thought people need to know this and I'm upset that we don't understand nutrition. We're bamboozled mm. by nutrition because there's so much propaganda and advertising coming our way. One day sugar is bad, the other day it's good, the other day fat is bad, and the other yeah. day fat is good. And our head is spinning. We don't know what's right and wrong. And it was just made so simple for me. You know, plants have the power to cure. And if we add more fruits and vegetables into our diet, and we can, little by little, adopt a plant-based diet, our chances of disease reduces. Yeah. So as you read this, was it that eureka moment right away you thought, this is my calling, this is my purpose? It really was. So who was the first person that you told about this new purpose? My dad and yeah. my mom. And how did they react? Well, I said, all right. And this is me like at home in my slippers, 26 years old, no job, not a penny to my name, like upstairs in my room that I grew up in as a child, you know, coming downstairs, my parents just getting home from work. And I'm like, guys, <laughs> I'm going to open a vegan restaurant chain. Oh, my gosh. So right then and there, you you knew you were going to open a chain. Yeah. Wow. And so what yeah. did they say to that? My dad goes, so you're telling me that in the worst economy since the Great Depression, you want to open a vegan fast food chain where only 1% of the population is vegan? And I was like, nope, I want to open a hundred. <laughs> and he's like, get a job, yeah. get a job. And you know, I like screamed at right. me. <laughs> and to the point that you alluded to, this was right around 2008, maybe 2007. That when, was 2008. When the economy had crashed. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so, so he says, get a job. I'm guessing you didn't get a job. 
So I did. I went and got a job at, well, one, I put my, um, my resume out there. And I wasn't getting to where? any interviews. I mean, anything on Craigslist. I was looking, you know, sales and marketing and just throwing my resume. And that felt horrible, yeah. that process. I was like, oh, this is not good. To be told no a million times. It feels be, awful. Yeah, it felt awful and just sort of like in the dark, you know, throwing my resume somewhere and hoping that it was something I'd be interested in and then having to go for an interview and not really knowing if this is what I wanted to do. And I thought, wait a minute, I'm, this is not right. Let me, I know I can dance. So I'm going to, in the meantime, just to find a place to live and pay rent, I'm going to uh, start giving salsa lessons. This is, I was like, it's hot right now. I know salsa. I professionally danced salsa for a long time. Oh. So I went into a Mexican restaurant and said, hey, I can bring in more people if you let me, if you rent your space to me for really cheap, I'll bring in a lot of people and they'll drink and I'll teach them, you know, I'll do a salsa class. And they're like, sure. So I started that, making some money. And then finally, I got serious about pursuing this dream to open a vegan restaurant. thought, I need to find someone in the industry who's doing something similar, you know, ask them questions, get some experience. I met the owners of what was Horizons, mm -hmm. but it's now Veg yeah. Restaurant, and they asked me to be their dining room manager. So that was great. I was able to work there for a while and get experience. So this whole time you have in your head that you want to just work your way towards building a restaurant chain. Absolutely. A vegan restaurant chain. Yeah. Wow. Hit me like a ton of bricks. Wow. And I mean, and just in describing the way you approach this, you already had an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial sort of mentality there. So, you know, you couldn't find a job and you made one up by walking into a Mexican restaurant and <laughs> creating a salsa school. <laughs> Did you believe that you could at that point create this restaurant chain? Like you were just looking for the right path or was there any doubt in your mind? You know, there's always doubt, but no, no, mainly I knew I could. Why? Well, partly I think I have... I, my nature is I'm optimistic. I'm an internal optimist. I'm always like, yes, we can do whatever we want to do together, you know, or I can, I can achieve. I have that naturally. But on another side, it, I also have to work for that. I said in the beginning, I've read like every self-help book. I, you know, study the law of attraction. I'm constantly uh, picking up inspirational books that like fire me up and yeah. get me going. So that's also like a repetitive learned thing for me as well. That takes practice. I still have to refresh myself on that all the time. So you start teaching salsa lessons, you get the job at Horizons. Did momentum slowly start to build? Like at what point were you truly beginning this venture, would you say? When I was at Horizons, I met the CEO of Cancer Treatment Centers of America. And he was dining at Horizons and said, you know, uh, we were talking about vegan food and he's vegan. And he said, somebody should open a chain of like vegan, really easy to get vegan food. And it was like, ding, it was uh -huh. like the universe put him right there. I'm like, I'm going to follow this guy, you know, and he asked me to come work for him. And he set up an opportunity for me to have executive mentoring. Wow. It was an incredible experience to work with the patient advocacy team. Yeah. Also continue the guest services side of the work I was, I had experience in and learning just how does corporation work? Yeah. You know, how do their board meetings, how is that set up? So that was awesome. And I also, I got signs and signals all the time yeah. and I just followed them. So throughout this, ha had you, in your spare time, been just making tons of different vegan foods? Like, because it's one thing to learn the business and the corporations, but you also have to be able to make delicious vegan food, right? That you can repeat multi over multiple stores. You, you already yeah. know that you want it to be a chain. So were you, were you making vegan food for others? Absolutely. So I was cooking for myself because it was really hard yeah. in 2008, 2009 to find vegan options anywhere. It's a lot different now. Yeah. So... I was definitely experimenting with different recipes, uh, but I was mainly focused on the how am I going to open this on the business plan yeah. and on the financial analysis. So I was really looking at it from that perspective. Mm -hmm. And I knew that at one point I would need to work with a great 
chef to come up with okay. recipes because I'm myself not a chef. And that's how I started. I uh, worked with a chef who consulted and I said, you know, I really love and the nostalgic crispy chicken sandwich with ranch and can we do something like that but vegan and how did they react they were like well we have to find something that's like chicken yeah. first you know and then i would i researched you know different products brought something in and over several months we were able to go back and forth with ideas and testing more testing and more ideas till we came up with the crispy hip city ranch yeah. that we sell currently today at what point did your parents start to believe in this vision because right your, your dad was like go get a job did he ever change his mind so my father is smartest guy i know nurse practitioner so bright i look up to him and i would always say to him when i was living there i said poppy you really need to try to eat more fruits and veggies. And he'd throw up his hands. He's like, I'm fine, I'm fine. And he had, you know, he was overweight. He had high blood pressure. He had type two, just was diagnosed with type two diabetes at wow. the time. And I, everything I'd been reading was telling me that that can be all reversed with a primarily plant-based diet. So, you know, nothing was convincing him until finally I went out, I bought, a cheap blender. I got, you know, spinach, went grocery shopping, came home and made him a green smoothie. The same one we sell today at Hip City Veg. And it was like a light bulb went off. He was hooked. He really? So you handed it to him and he took a sip? He took a sip and he goes, this is really great. He's like, this is spinach? <laughs> I can I can eat this much spinach like this? You know, yeah. like a yeah. real like, eye-opening moment from him. I'm like, yes, so let's try to like incorporate more of this. And then I um, lent him the China Study and Eat to Live by Dr. Joel Furman. And he was quickly convinced of the need to adopt a plant-based diet. And within two months, he lost 25 pounds. He was able to eliminate all four of his medications, um, achieve normal blood pressure, and put his type 2 diabetes into remission. Wow. So he's a nurse practitioner, so he's a medically trained professional. Absolutely. And he would tell me, look, this is genetic. The reason I have diabetes is because my father had diabetes, which really isn't surprising because medical professionals have four, six hours of nutritional education. Four to six hours. Four to six hours. Yeah. Right? Wow. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. So once it all worked, he must have been like, oh my gosh, go do this for everyone. <laughs> yeah. That's really when he was bought into the idea. Wow. So four years it took between, I guess, ideation and the opening of the restaurant. Mm -hmm. What were the months leading up to the restaurant's opening like? So I signed the lease for our first location in Rittenhouse Square in November of 2011. And I remember this like it was yesterday because I was freezing my butt off every single day. At the time, across the street, Serafina was the restaurant and it had a little juice bar. Yeah. I would go from, you know, on my computer, sitting in the juice bar, looking across the street to see what the contractors were doing, to running across, making sure that everything was okay. And it was intense. It was a little, I remember signing that lease and that security deposit. My landlord didn't know who I was, if I would, you know, if this would even succeed. Right. So it was nerve wracking. And how did you convince, because eating a plant-based diet wasn't as, I guess, quote unquote, mainstream at that time as it might be today. So how did you convince really anybody that this was gonna work? I was so sure of it that I think that came across yeah. whenever I spoke to someone. I believed with every fiber of my being that given the choice, people would wanna eat this way as long as it was tasted good yeah. and was satisfying. And so, I focused on presenting plant-based foods in a way that was familiar mm. to people, that branding-wise was attractive, and that looked as if we had multiple of these yeah. restaurants so that people felt confident and comfortable checking us out. 
Wow. So, so that they would be surprised to find out that it wasn't yet officially a chain. Right. That's some reverse psychology. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. really, really, that's compelling. So tell me about day one. Day one was crazy. Good and bad. Okay. Uh, I think good. Yes. Yeah, start with the good. It's really good. Yeah. Day one, we opened the doors at 10 a.m. And we had a line that wrapped around the block down Sansom, halfway down Sansom. It was incredible. I, who knew that? How did they know? <laughs> yeah. And it was one post by Michael Klein on Philly.com said, you know, this vegan yeah. fast casual is opening. What went through your mind when you saw that line, when you looked outside and saw people lining up? Your restaurant hadn't even opened yet, and you had that many customers. What was going through your head? I was like, yes, <laughs> let's do this. Let's rock this, you know? I was really just pumped. Definitely nervous because yeah. we had six employees, and within two weeks, I had to hire 23 more employees. My goodness. So day one, oh my gosh. Okay, so yeah. that's so many <laughs> in two weeks. <laughs> So people were lined up. Were you able to accommodate all those people? No. So we ran out of food by noon. My goodness. Yeah, Before so two hours. The afternoon. We ran out of food. <laughs> yeah. I had to close. Wow. I, I had no choice. I had no more food. So then we said, okay, we're going to buy double yeah. the food. So we ran out to the grocery store. You know, we bought all the produce we could. We brought it in, spent the entire night, zero sleep, prepping making huge batches, taking our recipes that were made, yielded four cups to turn that into four gallons. And we sold out of food the second day by 2 p.m. So then we had to go buy triple the food and do this again. No sleep. Everyone was working just outrageous. We could not do that today. You know, we could never justify doing anything like that, you know. And we sold out of food by 4 p.m. And so this went on for about a week. Now, it sounds like a great problem to have, but that must have been so stressful. It was incredibly stressful. I thought, oh, my God, what have I done? Are people not going to come back? Like, we look like we just don't have it together at all. I'm basically throwing food. Like, I would just, like, toss bags. I'm like, here's this. I think this is yours and toss it across the counter. And I'm like, thanks. Good luck, everyone. People were like with their arms in the air trying to like, hey, my food. Do you have an order for Michael? And I'd be like, Michael, I think this is your fajita. And like it was. Just throwing a touchdown. It was like, yeah, like a scene from a movie. It was really intense. But we made it through. So that went on for about a week. My investor was even there writing recipe, you know, making recipes go from four cups to four gallons, converting recipes. Sorry, I couldn't find the word. My parents were there. My mother worked for the first year as the um, drinks lady. So she would pour all the drinks. Oh, my goodness. Um, and she knew all the customers. That was really great. My dad was working at a school in Philadelphia. He's still a school nurse. And it was close enough that on his lunch break, he could come in get the cash, take the cash to the bank to deposit it, and then go back to work, Jeez. you know. So that went on for about a year. My goodness. And it was just a frenzy. It was a total frenzy and so worth it, though. Yeah. Well, everything that you had been pas so passionately saying was immediately proven right, right? Four years of planning and saying that and thinking about it, yes, turned out the day we opened, it, we were wow. right. So. You said you hired, what, 23? You, you went from six to 23? From six employees to 23. In that a matter was, of a couple of weeks. Yeah, I think that was probably one of the hardest things to do. Yeah, so there must have been growing pains. <laughs> uh, major growing pains, a lot of mistakes. I hadn't managed so many people before. Um, I was so focused on the task at hand, making sure that we kept the restaurant open and, and serving people the food that I forgot that, I mean... We talk about now every day culture and employee wellness and our managers really being our like number one asset, our employees being our number one asset. But if you looked at me in April of 2012, I was just like, I need you to cut a hundred peppers. Yeah. I need you to peel a thousand bananas. You know, I was just screaming. We were running around like crazy. So I think that intensity had, there was a lot of growing pains, but 
great lessons and we made it through. Yeah. How soon until you started opening up extra locations? October of 2014, we opened our second location in University City. So this is what, a little under two years? Yeah, a year and a half later. Okay. Exactly, a year and, and a half later. And then you started quickly getting more, yeah? Yeah, I then sort of got a little sidetracked and opened Charlie Was a Sinner. How did the idea for Charlie Was a Sinner come to be at a time when you said, I'm starting this chain, you know, at what point do you say... Actually, I'm going to also work on this other concept that's not the chain. Yeah, I had a great opportunity to work with um, a gentleman who's now another current investor in Hip City Veg. And I was learning so much from him at the time. And I saw this vacant spot on 13th Street. I thought that would make a great restaurant. And he goes, you know what? You're right. Let's do it. And I thought... Okay, <laughs> let's, you know, that's hard to turn down. Yeah. And I also knew that on that block in Philly, with a different concept, I could bring plant-based foods to people in just a, a different way. Full service, uh, more delicate, more refined, a little more upscale environment, yeah. and uh, bring an entirely plant-based meal within a cocktail bar. So your goal there was to just reach a different either demographic of people or different scenario of their week? That's you know? exactly right. Okay. Yeah. So so your mission was just to bring as many versions of plant-based eating to people's lives. Absolutely. You know, I wanted to go myself. I wanted to go into a sexy cocktail bar or a really great restaurant in Philadelphia that gave an exceptional experience, but be able to eat entirely plant-based, right. not have to worry. And what I love doing is creating an environment that just feels really good and people not even know really that it's a plant-based menu. Yeah. Not to trick people, yeah. but to make that not part of the thinking process. Like this is so normal, yeah. you don't even have to think about it. That's exactly what happened to me. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> so I did not know that Charlie was a sinner, was plant-based, and I have been there. Awesome. And, he, and I, I think I ate there. I definitely had cocktails until I was researching this conversation. It was like, wait a minute. Did I have? And I'm like, <laughs> <Right>. oh. <laughs> so yeah. mission accomplished. Thank you. And I, you know, I'm not trying to be sneaky. I, I really just want yeah. someone to have a great experience. And then it happened to be plant-based. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. I think that opens a door for a lot of people yeah. who never thought it was possible to have an entirely plant-based meal. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think a lot of people just dismiss that idea off the bat. I mean, I probably, I honestly did as well until I read that and was like, oh, I already have done that. Because I could probably count on one hand the number of non-meat meals I've had in the last 10 years. <laughs> like I eat a lot of meat. Right. And so, uh, you know, it was, it was not until that moment where I was like, okay, wait a minute. I've already done this without realizing it. <laughs> right. Is it really that bad? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. How was opening... A cocktail bar. What, what surprised you about that? How is that different than opening up a fast casual spot? A lot of differences. I mean, one, you're creating multiple menus. You're creating, you know, a dinner menu, a late night menu. You have so many parts of the menu. You know, pastry is a whole nother ball game as yeah. well. And then you have the cocktail yeah. bar. That's a moment where you have to bring in the talent to be able to execute this. And you rely heavily on the chef and the bar manager and the general manager to create that experience yeah. because you can't do it. You can't do it alone. I, I, the same thing for Hip City yeah. Veg and for a fast casual, but it's definitely a lot more replicable and you can systemize things so much more than you can with a full service restaurant like Charlie was a center. That's the big difference. So I can make these systems. Someone can go in, read the manual and understand how to do it. Where a full service, many full service restaurants and Charlie especially is up to the artist yeah. doing the work. You know, that bartender is skilled in a way that not every other bartender yeah. is. Yeah. It's almost an entirely new restaurant when you switch the bartender. <laughs> it really is. And you have to, it's such a good point because then you have to look back at the cocktail menu the whole and say, changed. 
okay, you know, his strength is here or her strength really is in this or she understands these spirits much more. So what are we going to do right. differently with the menu? And then you change the cocktail menu and then how does that pair with the food? Like it's just a, an entire system. Exactly. So the third restaurant that you opened up, Bon Bon? Yes, Par Bon Bon. This one is, is it Puerto Rican food? It's Latin inspired. Latin inspired food. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I would love to hear how your family reacted to that. Yeah, I, they were really excited for this. You know, I think my family was really excited to bring Puerto Rican food into Center City because yeah. we don't have that anywhere. We go to North Philly on Fifth Street to get our rice, you know, and yeah. my family would go to get their bed meal, which is, you know, pork and all of that. And so my family was excited to see Puerto Rican food and Puerto Rican flavors come into Center City. But my menu really is Latin inspired. So we pull from, you know, Mexican food, Peruvian food, yeah. Cuban, all over the place and, and really bring in, it's more about the flavors and uh, the inspiration of yeah. these different cuisines. That's great. So what excites you over looking ahead at the next year? for your mission in bringing a plant-based diet to as many people who want to undertake it. What's really exciting for me right now is seeing how the team is coming together to open four restaurants this year. So four new Hip City Veggies. Yeah. Wow. And where are they? We have one in Suburban Square, one in Radnor, another one in DC, in DuPont, and then we're reopening our Spruce Street Harbor Park. Gotcha. So you opened up a Hip City Veg in D.C. Mm -hmm. a couple years ago? 2016, yeah. How is the reception in D.C. different than the reception that you got in Philadelphia? Well, I totally underestimated our home field advantage. Okay. You know, people know our name. Philadelphia was so receptive and you know, accepting of us. Yeah. And so there's a lot of word of mouth about Hip City Veg here. And we didn't have that in DC. So this is where my job really starts to change from founder, entrepreneur to CEO, mm -hmm. where I have to think a lot more about marketing strategy. Scaling is a whole nother skill set. Yeah. So going to DC, I just thought, oh, we'll just open it. Yeah. And like, the and same there'll thing be people will, out the door and we'll run out of food by noon. <laughs> right. The same thing will happen, <laughs> yeah. you know. Yeah. And it didn't go that way. No. <laughs> you know, we had a really good opening you know, sort of reception, but we, w month after month, had to fight for every dollar yeah. because there was no brand awareness in an already very mature sort of fast casual food right. city. Also a very transient city where people will come and try you once, but then they live somewhere else. So those were obstacles. And then we just, we just kept going every day, pushing, pushing, fighting for every dollar. But the first time you opened the restaurant, though, there was no brand awareness here in Philly. Right. So why did that sustain? Why did the opening success sustain itself in Philly, do you think? And, and not so much DC. Is it, is it that transientness? I think because... When we opened in 2012, there were also no other fast casuals, really. Okay. I mean, there were probably a, f a couple, but within a one block radius after we opened, eight more fast casuals opened. Yeah. Wow. So at the time, we were just the only ones on yeah. the block. That had something to do with it. And I think people were really hungry for a new, healthier option yeah. from what was out there. So that had a lot to do with it, where in 2016 in D.C., a lot had changed already and people were eating and are eating more plant based there. So we got in, I think, at the beginning of a wave in Philly. Yeah. And that's probably a big difference. You got in at the beginning of two waves, right? Vegan, plant based eating, fast casual dining. Is there anything today that you think is a wave that's just starting that people might not know about? Like they may not have seen those two trends in, in 2012? Convenience, Uber convenience is ever evolving and getting more and more aggressive. So how people order has changed yeah. entirely, how 
fast casuals are going to approach delivery or like sweet greens in California setting up stations within office buildings so people don't even have to leave their office building now to get their food. They're no longer going to need probably brick and mortar. So that's really the way we order and the way we get our food is a whole nother shift that's going to happen. That's the next wave. Yeah. That's fascinating. I, I have started to see little almost kiosks open up in office buildings. And I guess I never really realized that that's the next wave. That is. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we're even behind regarding technology right now. We're developing our mobile app and all of our competitors have a mobile app yeah, yeah. that they reach, you know, probably 30% of their of their guests that way, right. if not more. So I have a couple questions that I ask every guest just to get different perspectives from different people in different walks of life. What would you say is a common misconception about you? I think about this sometimes, it's so small, but I was on an interview and someone asked me like rapid firing questions. Like, what time do you go to sleep and what time do you wake up? And I told them I go to sleep around midnight, 1230 or sometimes one and I get up around 630 and they're like, oh, I thought you were the type of person that went to bed like at 930 p.m. and got up like at 430 in the morning and worked out. Yeah. I was like, I wonder how people do perceive me, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. it, <laughs> I don't know what that says about me. I don't know. If you could send a message to yourself in the past, butterfly effect aside, mm -hmm. uh, at any point, at what point in time would you send it and what would you say? I would send a message probably when I was first opening Hip City Veg to relax a little bit. It's all going to be okay. You know, because I probably more emotional than I needed to be, more just everything was a sense of urgency. Although that also, that's what got me through the first couple of years. Right. That's hard, Yeah, you know? Yeah. From your perspective, whether as a CEO in the food industry, you know, with your passion of plant-based diets, what plant-based diets, what, what would you say is the biggest challenge facing Philadelphia today? Inspiring and attracting the right people on the bus. I think that we have so many restaurants. There's constantly more restaurants opening and there's a good healthy competition going on. There's really talented people out there and they have a choice to work with anyone, whoever they want, they get to pick. And so what is going to differentiate that for them? And our challenge is to always focus on the why of what we do, understanding the mission behind this work because restaurant work is really hard. Yeah. You know, there our employees are you know working over 400 degree grills yeah. and our managers at the end of a long shift then they have to make sure that the equipment is cleaned right and you know closing the doors late at night. So this is laborious, hard work, and what is going to make that difference for them. And so the challenge, and it's a great challenge to um, accept, is to what can we do for employee benefits, for employee wellness, and attract great people and keep them with us. Yeah. What excites you most about Philadelphia today? What excites me most about Philadelphia is the inpouring of amazing talent coming into the city. We have people from New York, from the West, everyone's flowing into Philadelphia because it's a cool, cool city. Yeah. It has so much culture and the food, in my opinion, is the best in the country. And I know that's a bold statement. Yeah. People challenge me all the time on that, but I travel and I'm trying food everywhere. And we definitely have the best plant-based food in the city, in the country. So what's exciting is to see how many people are coming here and what they're bringing yeah. to this great city and everything growing. Finally, if you could get one message to every single Philadelphian, be it a billboard, plane in the sky, text message, email, tweet, whatever, what would you say? When we think about sustainability, let's look at the fact that animal agriculture accounts for more greenhouse gases than any car, truck, plane, power plant combined in the world.
world. And so that means that food, our food choices, are at the forefront of sustainability. For more on Nicole and her restaurants, you can check out the show notes or head to podphillyhoo.com forward slash hip city. That's H-I-P-C-I-T-Y. If you like the show and want to help it grow, tell a friend. Really, text them right now. It really helps. Also, be sure you're subscribed and leave us a rating and follow along on Twitter and Instagram at podphillyhoo. Philly Who is a Q9 production. This episode is produced and hosted by me, Kevin Schmidlin, and the associate producer is Angela Gervasi, with editing by Max Graham, music by Lee Rosevere, and artwork by Lauren Carhart. For Philly Who, my name is Kevin Schmidlin. Thanks for listening. <laughs>